Diana's dog ate dog. Oh, sorry. Most of us have been taught that there that? was an ice age that profoundly yes. influenced the Earth's climate, caused mass extinctions, and even altered the way civilization developed. But when it happened, and why it happened, remains a mystery. Was there an ice age? Were there many? Did they last thousands or even millions of years? And what caused them? Marcus Lloyd, welcome to Unlocking the Mysteries of Genesis. Have you ever wondered what the Ice Age was like? When you hear the term Ice Age, you might think of snow as far as the eye can see. Now, evidence of at least one Ice Age is abundant. Where glaciers once were, you see boulders and rocks and dirt, which indicate the path of debris the glacier left behind as it moved. By these debris fields, or glacier moraines, Scientists have determined that huge glaciers covered large areas of most continents. Most scientists agree that an ice age was the last major geologic event to happen on this planet. Some theories even suggest that the ice age contributed to the extinction of the dinosaurs. But differences of opinion exist on the number of ice ages there were, and when, and for how long. U.S. News and World Report even call the cause of the ice age one of the great mysteries of science. But why is there such a vast difference of opinion of whether there was one ice age or many ice ages or when they happened? The reason secular scientists hold to the idea that there were multiple ice ages over millions of years is that they have to in order to make their theories about everything else work. Whether it relates to geology or fossils or evolution or the ice age, Uniformitarian thinking requires an Earth calendar that goes back billions of years. Just one ice age doesn't fit their timeline for the age of the Earth. If they acknowledge that there was but one ice age not that long ago, all of their other theories based on long Earth ages would crumble too. Creation scientists, on the other hand, believe the evidence shows that the ice age can happen quickly and probably lasted only a few hundred years, which matches the biblical timeline and confirms again that the Earth can be radically and quickly altered by a global catastrophe such as Noah's Flood. Let's head to Alaska to explore some of the evidence for ourselves. Here we are on the Matanuska Glacier, a 27 mile long river of ice in South Central Alaska. Secular scientists believe that glaciers like these formed hundreds of thousands and even millions of years ago. But we'll see that what we believe about how and when these glaciers formed and when one or more ice ages occurred largely depends on our point of view. Remember, secular scientists typically take a uniformitarian point of view that assumes geological processes went gradual and slow, unfolding over thousands or millions of years. Creation scientists, on the other hand, believe that geological processes can happen rapidly as the result of very high energy processes. We'll explore the evidence from both schools of thought as they apply to the mystery of the Ice Age. First, let's hear the secular perspective. The secular theorists believe there have been at least five major ice ages throughout Earth history that have lasted, in some cases, tens of millions of years. The most recent of these supposedly began about 2.6 million years ago, and they think that within this most recent ice age, you had these smaller 
ice ages, these glacial cycles. So currently they think there's been about 50 of these small ice ages, if you will, these glacial cycles within the last 2.6 million years. To arrive at these theories about ice ages, scientists study glaciers, among other evidence. Glaciers are massive bodies of dense ice that are constantly moving under their own weight. As you'd imagine, they grow when the amount of snow in any given year exceeds the amount of melting, and shrink back, of course, when there's more melting than snow. To determine whether a glacier has undergone this cycle of expanding and retreating over time, some of the things scientists look at are the patterns of debris and glacial moraines. When you look at the types of soil on the surfaces where there have been ice ages, there appear to be places where the ice moved and then stopped, melted back, left a certain type of soil, and then moved out again and back. So in addition to studying glacial debris, Scientists also theorize about glacial periods by examining ice cores. In this method, scientists drill deep into the ice and take samples of ice from polar and low latitude mountain glaciers to analyze the chemical composition of all the layers of ice. Indicators like the amount and type of oxygen isotopes, the concentration of methane, and the amount of dust gives clues about the climate during each cycle. The uniformitarian view is that each layer of ice cores represents one year. And by this measure, they've estimated that the Greenland and Antarctic ice sheets are millions of years old. But what even causes these cycles with long periods of ice formation and then long periods with a lack of snowfall and the ice melts? That's a question that scientists have been wrestling with for years. In fact, secular scientists offer over 60 ice age theories. There's clearly no consensus on what causes an ice age, but currently the astronomical theory is the most popular explanation. Basically the idea is that the Earth, as it's going around the sun, you know, you have its rotational axis, and the orientation of that axis changes very slowly over time. And not only that, but the shape of the Earth's orbit changes slightly over time as well. And so that results in these very subtle changes in the amount of sunlight that's falling in the mid to high northern latitudes during the summer months. During that period of time, there will be more ice accumulating, the more snow. As it accumulates, as it spreads out and becomes more coverage over the continents, the surface of the ice reflects more radiation to space during the daytime, and at night, it emits infrared radiation to space more effectively. Both of those cause cooling, which causes more ice to form, and so the ice age will accumulate and then suddenly the orbital parameters will shift enough that suddenly there's more sun and it melts very quickly. Based on physical evidence like glacial moraines, chemical analysis of layers of microorganisms that comprise seafloor sediments, and ice cores, uniformitarians believe that there have been multiple ice ages over long stretches of time. But there are some problems with these methods of measuring the age of ice. Secular scientists have acknowledged that the astronomical theory cannot by itself explain ice ages. You have to assume that some other unknown mechanisms can amplify these small changes enough to actually cause an ice age. But they have not, to date, figured out what this mechanism is. So there's more we need to understand before we can really settle on the astronomical theory as a likely explanation. There are also some issues with the way secular scientists measure ice cores. On the surface, it appears to make sense. Popular accounts give the impression that the dating of ice cores is quite simple. You just visually identify layers and count them. 
The reality is much more complicated. In practice, it's a lot more difficult than simply counting these seasonal variations that you see in the ice cores because those layers become indistinct as you go deeper into the ice. So they have to use something called this flow model that tells you how the ice thins with increasing depth. And those flow models have assumptions built into them. And basically those assumptions assume that the ice sheets have been in existence for millions of years and that they've had more or less the same height for all that time. And so those models predict that you're gonna get this enormous amount of thinning as you go deeper in the ice. And so naturally you're just gonna end up from that model with a very large number of annual layers. One might make the assumption that colder winters are the catalyst for an ice age. But there's one big problem with that notion. Extremely cold temperatures generally result in less, not more, snowfall. Cold air has less moisture. Less moisture means less snow. Look at some of the very cold places on the Earth today. Even here in Alaska, the summers are too warm for a glacier to form. Warm summers would be a problem for any ice age since they would melt any ice sheets or glaciers that were starting to form. Numerous theories focus on the decrease of temperature due to secular assumptions of uniformitarianism. In reality, a combination of several things have to happen to create an ice age. Let's head back to the cozy, warm lab to discuss this. To create an ice age, first we need heat. Let's say that tectonic friction and underwater volcanoes raise the temperature of the oceans by 10 to 20 degrees Celsius. Then, as the oceans warm, more water evaporates. More moisture in the air means more precipitation, including more snowfall at mid and high latitudes. Then, eruptions from volcanoes on the land eject aerosols into the stratosphere. These tiny solid particles in liquid droplets block and reflect the sun's rays back into space. Moisture from evaporation gets trapped in, while energy from the sun gets trapped out. The result? Cooler summers when the winter snow doesn't melt, followed by winters when more snow falls. As the snow packs down, the pockets of air in between the ice crystals get squeezed out, and what's left is ice. As this cycle continues, the ice sheets continue to grow, and then you have an ice age. You can remember this cycle by the acronym HEAT, H for hot oceans, E for evaporation, A for aerosols, and T for time. So to make an ice age, we need hot oceans, evaporation, aerosols, and time. And less time than you'd think. But what could cause the oceans to heat up that much and throw aerosols into the atmosphere high enough to block the sun's rays? Creation scientists attribute it to a catastrophe of global proportions, Noah's flood. Could Noah's flood have created the right conditions for an ice age to follow? By looking at one example from the recent past, we can see how just one big volcanic eruption can throw enough aerosols into the air to block the sun's rays and lower the surface temperature of the Earth for an extended period. Here's what happened. In June of 1991, on Luzon Island in the Philippines, the dormant stratovolcano Mount Pinatubo suddenly erupted. The eruption sent approximately 10 billion tons of volcanic ash and debris miles into the sky. The eruption was several times larger than the one at Mount St. Helens. Fragmented materials from the explosion were so vast, they covered the South China Sea and plunged the island of Luzon into total darkness. Aerosols reached high into the stratosphere. The increased amounts of ash and sulfuric acid from the eruption caused a roughly one degree Fahrenheit decrease in temperature around the world for about two years. In August of 1991, the space shuttle captured dramatic pictures of two stratospheric aerosol layers from the Mount Pinatubo eruption. Many scientists who believe in the Bible explain the Ice Age as the result of catastrophic events such as what happened in the Philippines. When I say catastrophic, I mean, and try to get your head around the sight of volcanoes and other explosions with the power of nuclear bombs detonating all over the world at the same time. And imagine that massive energy. 
energy like the planet hadn't experienced since creation. Now picture hundreds of Mount Pinatubos erupting at the same time. Whew, talk about energy. Creation scientists believe that during Noah's flood, powerful energy was generated not only from massive storms, but by volcanism, earthquakes, and massive shifting of the planet's tectonic plates. Evidence of volcanic and tectonic potential this destructive can be found literally around the planet. The heating of the ocean, we believe, came from magma coming from the mantle up through the plates in the ocean. That would have caused tremendous heating to the ocean, as much as a temperature of 90 degrees Fahrenheit. That would have produced tremendous evaporation, energizing of storms, hurricanes, and producing snow and ice in the polar regions and on mountaintops. Another example from recent history shows that it doesn't take millions of years to form a thick glacier. Crater Glacier on Mount St. Helens is already over 300 feet thick, despite the fact that it's only been forming since the 1980 eruption. Today, secular and creation scientists agree that warming oceans contribute to changing weather patterns. All you have to do is turn on the TV to see evidence that storms are more severe in some areas, while other areas are experiencing record-setting heat and drought. Could the destruction of Noah's flood been catastrophic enough to cause a worldwide change in climate? Enough to cause one ice age? Creation scientists think it's entirely plausible, and they are using sophisticated computer modeling to prove it. When the heat came up from the plates in the oceans, it caused the oceans to become very warm and it would be like a giant El Nino effect. Well, can you imagine if the oceans were 20, 30, 40 degrees warmer than they are today? We would expect all kinds of severe weather, gigantic hurricanes, which I call hypercanes, and this would produce all kinds of evaporation into the atmosphere, which could then come out as snow in the polar regions and on mountaintops. I've modeled that with conventional models with a sea surface temperature hotter than we would normally experience today. When that happens, these models predict much, much greater precipitation rates, particularly in the polar regions and on mountaintops. And we can explain the ice age in less than 500 years simply by the warmth of the ocean. So if you take a look at destruction caused by recent tsunamis, mudslides, volcanoes, and earthquakes, it's not hard to imagine the destruction that Noah's flood caused. Imagine that everywhere you step was at one time underwater. When Noah and his family were finally able to step on land again, the Earth's surface was probably more like a giant mudslide. Then you add an enormous amount of aerosol particles from explosive volcanic eruptions, preventing solar radiation from warming the Earth. There would have been a massive cooling effect that would have been most pronounced during the summer and autumn months. This would have prevented the snow from melting, resulting in more and more snow. The result was the Ice Age. Man, how people must have struggled to survive during that time. It's almost unimaginable. But humans and civilization did survive the worldwide catastrophe, thanks to Noah and his obedience. And from that small group of people, civilization was rebuilt. So how did humans survive? In the creation model, there were not multiple brutal ice ages that lasted thousands of years, as secular models theorize. It was just one. And while it probably was not a whole lot of fun for the people living in it, it wasn't as bad as you think. The Ice Age would not have been equally severe everywhere. Even at their greatest extent, there probably would have only covered maybe 30% of the Earth's land surface. And at lower latitudes, you would have had some areas that would have been very lush. So it's not going to be equally severe everywhere. There's going to be some places where it's quite temperate, and it's, it's not such a bad thing. Some people may have lived, for instance, at the edges of those ice sheets in Europe and places like that. And so it might have been a little bit harsh in some cases, but for the creation model of the Ice Age, the Ice Age is a lot more tolerable than the uniformitarian model. So when we hear that glaciers are melting, and when we see increasingly violent storms creating massive destruction, should we be worried? All I can say is that you can take comfort in what God said in the eighth chapter of Genesis. 
I will never again curse the ground for man's sake, although the imagination of man's heart is evil from his youth, nor will I again destroy every living thing as I have done. God placed a sign in the sky after the flood as a promise that he would not destroy the earth again by flood. I set my rainbow in the cloud, and it shall be for the sign of the covenant between me and the earth. And why is that important? It's another example of how God fulfills his covenant. Remember what God promised to Noah. Genesis 9, 1 tells us, God blessed Noah and his sons and said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. Even secular scientists agree that the glaciation during the ice age caused the sea levels to drop, revealing bridges of land between continents. They also agree that as these ice sheets expanded, they forced humans and animals to migrate to warmer latitudes in order to survive. Could this have just been coincidence? I like to think it was just God's way of helping mankind fulfill his command. Now we've seen some pretty convincing evidence that the effects of Noah's flood could have caused the ice age. And as technology advances, we are learning more and more about how science confirms the truths of scripture. The world can be a cold place when you go at it alone. But with God, there's always a shelter from the storm. After the Lord destroyed the earth by a catastrophic flood, and because Noah was faithful to God's word, the Lord gave humanity a second chance on earth. By letting Noah and his family live to repopulate the earth, God's gift of grace was given to mankind. It's because of his grace that you and I are here today. Join me next time as we take a fascinating look at how ancient civilization began again after Noah's flood. We'll ask a lot more questions and we'll find the answers together as we continue to unlock the mysteries of Genesis. Questions, thoughts? Just very interesting, lots of great information. Yeah, I was just thinking, you know, if, if the world, if the earth was flooded, all of all of that uh, water evaporating would have had a cooling effect on the earth. So it's not hard to believe uh, the theories that they were suggesting. I had, I had never heard about multiple ice ages and um, I no, guess no. I had always heard of just one ice age. So I don't know if like, you know, as secular scientists try to um, kind of prove their theory about that old earth and the, you know, the millions slash billions of years rather than the the younger earth kind of thing which again those those terms young old earth young earth those were things that i don't remember being exposed to in school so i don't know if just because of my age you know teachers were still more likely to be christian and believe the Bible, or if that was just my experience that I was not really aware of the, you know, non-Christian kind of um, perspective. 
Um, but the whole, after we saw the thing on Noah's Ark and the whole, um, all the lands together and the tectonic and the water rising up and the water falling down kind of a thing, that, that kind of works together for me with the whole um, blood Noah account thing. Kind of puts another, how they work. Perspective sort of on it. Work together, yeah, a different perspective that I wouldn't have necessarily thought about. The, I guess the only thing that kind of I question in my head a little bit is, okay, if, you know, if I live in the Texas area, would I have necessarily without internet and phone calls and things like that, would have I have necessarily even known if the whole world's not covered in ice, would have, I have even known? So I. You know, I don't, there's no, he used a phrase that he said, the biblical timeline of uh, the ice age. And you don't hear like people in Jerusalem necessarily talking about, oh, it's 30% of the earth mass is currently covered in ice. You don't, I, you know, you, I don't know if I'm explaining it very well, but. I, I, I think I understand what you're saying. I thought as I was growing up um, and younger that everybody believed this same thing because I went to church, you know, with my family and was in a private uh, Baptist school um, through the younger part of my years. And I just thought everybody believed the same thing until I got older and realized, oh, no, there's different uh perspectives and looks and oh no this isn't right in the secular world you know telling you um differences and i'm oh no god created the heaven and the earth it's in the bible and then you know of course some people just don't believe the bible so it was uh, um startling for me that there was differences of opinion i guess i'm trying to say thing any other questions or comments i'm not as vocal today for obvious reasons a couple things one is that I'd, I'd like more information and i, I need to find out more about <laughs> about and and the scientists behind this uh these concepts but also, what disturbs me is the climate change religion. If what we heard today indicates that, just like if you don't, if, if Houston no longer really can support jobs, then you need, need to move to Miami or you know wherever to find a job. And it sounds like the same thing applies to climate change. If if uh, I do know that what they're talking about now is that the climate change is helping Africa because there's more rain. You need water, period. Water has to be in, right. in the element. So if climate change is affecting certain parts of the world better, then we're really talking about <clears throat> whose ox is gourd, really, concept. So, and what I'm hearing is that the United States for the next, it, it's in such a great position because of our rivers and our and our agricultural, uh, we, we should do extremely well for the next hundred years. Period, regardless of what happens. But the rest of the world, this climate change, there's going to be certain areas, like in, in Central Africa, that it's going to be fine because of the moisture and the rain and that sort of thing. So, I, I I'm concerned about that. But I'm also <laughs> one of the wild thought is that I'm worried about. Ukraine in the sense that if they set off a couple of those atomic bombs, <clears throat> this concept of, uh, of uh, weather change may be dramatic in a very short period of time because the earth spins and that radiation and those clouds uh, will start covering the, the planet. Those are my thoughts.
the other thing I thought is like, I was, I can maybe blame, blame myself for not being very world aware for a whole Mount St. Helens thing. I remember it a little bit, but like, I didn't even remember at all the volcano eruption that they talked about in 1991. Okay, Alexis was a little... <laughs> Um, she had had a couple of surgeries at that point I was back at work so I wasn't sleeping and exhausted I'm sure I wasn't coming home every night and immediately turning on the world news but how did I m miss that big yeah. eruption of the yeah, volcano yes. in the Philippines I mean I don't even remember it at all I don't even remember that at all either don't think it affected us. Well, it sounds like it did, Mickey. The way they talked about the yeah, but that, but those effects aerosols and everything. Uh, but a two a two degree Fahrenheit shift here in the U.S. for most of us, <laughs> we wouldn't notice. But not that. to the extent of, of starvation. If you if Ukraine if they start exploding, bear with me. Yeah, if they start yeah. exploding, uh, nuclear war has in a. Ukraine, which is a massive grain, that you have massive amounts of grain coming from that part of the world. If that happens and we no longer are able to get grain from that part of the world, you're talking about mass starvation in, in the Middle East and in Indonesia, and it's not going to affect us per se. I mean, it's going to be expensive to buy bread, but I guess that's my point. There's a degree of, of, uh, of, of, uh, <clears throat> the effect of uh, this particular volcanic uh, eruption. It didn't, it didn't affect us that much. Well, and there are a number of examples. Um, there's one in the late 14th century, if I'm placing the timeline correct, there was what they call the, 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 the year without a summer. Right. Where um, it was no that, you know, I mean, literally it was a year without a summer. They had you know, they would go days when not being able to see the sun in the way we see the sun. And now they've traced it back again to a, somewhere in the Pacific, fairly massive um, a volcanic explosion. There was Krakatoa in the, in the 1800s <coughs> that had measurable effects around the world. It, and to your point, Mickey, while it may not affect the grain producing areas like in the United States because they're large and they're more tolerant because of other things, you have a lot of these areas in the world that are marginal where right. slight, slight shifts in precipitation patterns or slight shifts in, um, in temperature can render something from being capable of producing to not being able to produce. That's correct. Uh, one of my little areas of interest in the last year has been, we've got a couple of podcast episodes on this, what's called the late Bronze Age collapse, which is, there's, it's around a thousand to twelve hundred BC, and all of these thriving civilizations in the in the Middle East and in Turkey and um, well, some of the some of the some of the ites we know from the Bible, all of a sudden disappear over the space of about fifty to sixty years. And there's a great debate on how much of that was maybe drought or climate triggered versus um, political unrest and things. It's just a mystery why all of these civilizations collapsed at the same time, basically. And, uh, but one of the theories relates to some, some known volcanic uh, eruptions that may have disrupted weather patterns in that area and thus caused drought and <coughs> uh, people mi forced migration coming in and taking over these areas from the outside because people were migrating to find places where they could grow and have food. I'm going to go ahead and start the other video. The Rise of Civilization will have just enough time to do that. So I'm going to get that started now if I am smart enough to put the right set of keystrokes together. Have one of those days. Let me know when you guys can hear this one is when you just wanted some time alone. But wherever you went, there was always somebody else, and somebody else, and oh, somebody else. 
and on and on until where did all these people come from? There are seven billion of us on this planet, living in 200 nations, speaking 6,000 languages. The Bible says we are each descended from Noah and his three sons. But is that really possible? Seven billion from the family of one man. Think of all the people who have lived and died, all the countries, all the cultures, all the civilizations that have existed. Did these spring from a single family? How did we ever end up like this? I'm Marcus Lloyd, and welcome to Unlocking the Mysteries of Genesis. Today, we're going to take a look at us. How did we get where we are? Spread all over the world, speaking different languages, living different lives. We know that there have been many different civilizations, past and present, and each one has left their monuments for us. The pyramids in Egypt, the terracotta army in China, the breathtaking Machu Picchu in Peru, the cave drawings in France, the temples in Greece. How did we do all of that in the relatively short time span of so-called modern civilization? Well, secular and creation scientists offer different answers to our origins and our development as well. In 1863, the scientist Thomas Huxley wrote the book entitled Evidence as to Man's Place in Nature. In it, he illustrated what he saw as the similarities and differences between humans and apes. This was the first time the concept of evolution had been applied to people. A few years later, in 1871, Darwin published The Descent of Man, which points to the similarities between humans and animals not just physically, but in terms of emotional and intellectual capacities as well. Now this belief in human evolution and the idea that humans are basically just evolved animals profoundly influenced the way that we looked at when and how human society developed and even how we look at ourselves. For the moment, let's explore the prevailing theories about how modern humans migrated throughout the entire Earth and developed the numerous races and languages that we see today. Secular scientists believe humans and apes shared a common ancestor millions of years ago. We were all part of a big family of hominids that included humans, chimpanzees, and gorillas. Around 8 million years ago on the African continent, humans began to evolve and diverge from their ape-like ancestors. Over 6 million years ago, humans began to walk upright, use tools, migrate, and develop language. Only recently, in the past 100,000 years or so, they developed into modern humans. Only within the last 12,000 years did humans develop agriculture and begin building what we think of as modern civilization. Secular scientists began looking for the earliest evidence of hominids in Africa. Since the 1920s, scientists have uncovered numerous fossils they claim to be early ancestors of modern humans, the missing links that evidence man's evolution from primates. The first so-called transitional fossil was found in South Africa in the 1920s. It was named Australopithecus africanus and it was claimed to be an intermediate species that lived between two and three million years ago. In 1974, the skeleton of another possible human ancestor was found in Ethiopia. This time, it was the famous Australopithecus afarensis that the discoverers named Lucy. Since that time, more hominid skeletons have been found, each one debatably a human ancestor that evidenced evolution. 
Secular scientists believe that over millions of years, humans showed gradual advancements in physical, mental, and emotional capabilities. The ability to walk on two legs, a larger brain, the ability to use tools, and the development of language and social customs. According to the Out of Africa theory, the first anatomically modern human, Homo sapiens, originated in Africa about 200,000 years ago. And the proof, they claim, is in the human genome. Secular scientists will talk about two genetic progenitors of the human race, mitochondrial Eve and Y chromosome Adam. But they do not believe that there was a literal Adam and Eve. They'll say you can trace female mitochondrial DNA, it's a small subset of DNA passed on through mothers, back to a single woman. But they would say that woman was part of a larger population. You can look at Y chromosome, exists only in males, gets passed on only through males. Look at male diversity, trace it back to one guy. They'll say, well, that male was the progenitor of modern Y chromosomes, but he also existed as part of a population. So mitochondrial Eve, Y chromosome Adam, secular scientists say the diversity in these subsets of DNA go back to two individuals, but the vast majority of DNA goes back to a population, and these two individuals existed as part of a population, and therefore Adam and Eve are not literally true. So if our common ancestors lived in Africa, how did we spread across the planet? Secular scientists say that over time, early humans moved out of Africa and migrated around the globe, in part due to changes in climate and the food supply. As man dispersed around the planet, they suggest, different races began to appear as we became more genetically diverse. That's why we find, for example, darker skin and hair color in warmer climates, lighter coloration to the north. But there is more to the story. So secular scientists use the very simple principle of inheritance to infer genealogical relationships as well as geographical relationships among the human population. When reproduction happens, DNA gets passed on, some from dad, some from mom, and it gets passed on imperfectly. So as generations keep happening, as time goes forward, subsequent generations grow more genetically distant from previous generations. And so you can use these differences to sort of dial the clock back or look backwards in time. So these siblings are close. This uncle's a little bit more distant. This person over here is maybe even more distant. This, this principle is the basis for paternity testing. Who's, who's the father of this child? Well, let's see who matches genetically the most close. So that same principle is then applied around the planet. Now, evolutionists have used these data to argue that humans evolved out of Africa. If you look within the African ethnic groups on the African continent, the most genetic diversity exists among these African groups. And so they say, well, they must be the most distant from one another, therefore the most ancient splits in the human population occurred in Africa. So, after a slow and gradual evolution into Homo sapiens and migration to other continents besides Africa, secular scientists claim that man took a great leap forward about 40 to 50,000 years ago. The development of symbolic and written language enabled the sharing of knowledge and skills in an unprecedented manner. Once language happened, the world would never be the same. Human language is a symbolic system that uses symbols to refer to objects and events. And those symbols carry meaning and therefore may refer to things in the past, present, and the future. But animal communication is basically an iconic signaling system. It functions to warn others of danger and aggressiveness and what have you. The system is functional, it does not carry meaning. There are other theories of the development of language, the origin of language. Noam Chomsky has argued that human language did not develop from animal communication. The communication systems, in his words, seem to operate on entirely different processes and principles. Many anthropologists place the beginnings of modern civilization about 12,000 years ago, a very short time even in the evolutionary timeline. When the development of agriculture enabled people to give up nomadic lifestyle and to live in one place, civilization began to flourish. By 2200 BC, the secular history of civilization and the biblical account began to overlap. 
In the mid-1800s, expeditions by John G. Taylor near the Iraqi city of Baghdad excavated the famous ziggurat of Ur. Among the ruins, Taylor found cuneiform cylinders that identified the site by its biblical name, Ur of the Chaldeans, the birthplace of Abraham. Until that time, Ur had been considered a, a mythical city. But now there was no denying that the historical evidence confirmed what was written in the Bible. Another groundbreaking discovery happened in 1974, when an Italian archaeologist uncovered the tablets of Ebla in Tel Mardik, an ancient city in modern Syria. These clay tablets were covered with writings in ancient Sumerian, as well as a local language of Ebla. There were 1,800 complete tablets and about 4,700 fragments determined to date between 2,500 and 2,250 B.C. The tablets, likewise, make reference to people and places we find in the Bible. They mention Abraham as well as Sodom and Gomorrah. In fact, all the cultures found in the Bible have been verified by archaeologists within the last 150 years. Nineveh and Babylon have also been located and excavated. Cities like Damascus, Jerusalem, and Jericho have thrived continuously for over 4,000 years. So if written history and archaeological artifacts seem to confirm the biblical data, is it possible that all the global population can be traced back to Noah's sons? Genesis chapter 9, verses 18 and 19 discusses the population of the earth. It says... Now the sons of Noah who went out of the ark were Shem, Ham, and Japheth. These three were the sons of Noah, and from these the whole earth was populated. The Bible also speaks of the population after the flood in Genesis chapter 10, verse 32, which reads, These were the families of the sons of Noah, according to their generations in their nations, and from these the nations were divided on the earth after the flood. If you use a very modest population growth rate, one where each person is replaced by 1.2 people, you can arrive at a number that is actually far beyond today's current population. So if that's the average from the time frame from the flood's ending to today, which is roughly four and a half thousand years, you have today's population. And that's assuming that the generations, that is from one generation to the next, is four or three times each century, 45 centuries. As populations spread and diversified, so did language. But unlike the secular view of it, the disbursement of language was not some gradual, natural result of migration. It was the result of man's arrogance. See, the descendants of Noah's sons are called Hamitic, Shemitic, and Japhetic. United by a common language, these groups conspired to build a city with a tower that reached to heaven. To prevent humanity from uniting in evil, God scattered them abroad from the Tower of Babel over the face of all the earth and confused the language of all the earth so that they may not understand one another's speech. Scattering the people and confusing a common language into many was God's way of intervening in the affairs of mankind while keeping his promise that there would not be another worldwide catastrophe like the flood. This event resulted in the founding of the 70 original nations. The descendants of Noah were dispersed and, as Genesis 10:5 says, separated into their lands, everyone according to his language, according to their families, into their nations. Secular linguists have identified about 70 major language groups around the world, same as in the Bible. 300 languages and even more dialects within each language would eventually grow from those spoken in the nations identified in scripture. The Shemitic nations spread through what we call the Middle East, while the descendants of Ham populated Africa and Asia, and the Japhethite people settled in present day Europe each developed its own new language. Today, we recognize that people from these different regions of the world have different physical features, like skin color or the shape of their eyes. Can the Bible, or even science, explain how we arrived at all this physical diversity from just eight people? The best way to understand genetic diversity among 
all the people on this planet is to realize that it's really broken down into two categories. There's common variants that might differ between me and you, but maybe I'll share some with Africans and, and Africans will share them with the Aborigines. There's, there are these common variants. Then there's rare variants that are localized, perhaps only to Africa or only to Europeans or only to Peruvians, some restricted ethnic group. So two groups of variants today, common variants, rare variants, even the secular scientists are saying these rare variants arose in the last couple thousand years consistent with a shrinking of the human population at the time of the flood, Noah, his wife, his sons and their wives. And these common variants probably go back to Adam and Eve. God created variation from the start. Evolutionists assume away this creation as a source of variation, assume it's all mutation. But once you put that back in the picture, easy to explain all the variation we see within the last couple thousand years. There's a principle in genetics called the founder principle that suggests the enforced segregation of mankind into small inbreeding tribal units would generate a rapid development of the distinctive physical characteristics associated with each tribe. The genetic and geographic isolation also leads to each tribe developing its own cultures, tools, and ways of life. You see the shared knowledge base of the history of the human race as it was shared until you get to the split up of people at the Tower of Babel. You see that in the memories of Noah's flood as well as in memories of the events in the earlier chapters of Genesis. For example, the ancient Chinese in their oracle bones have pictographic vocabulary that show that they had a memory of what is in Genesis 1, Genesis 2, the fall of mankind in Genesis 3, the killing of one brother by another in Genesis 4, the flood itself, and then the split up of languages. We do see garbled memories in the literatures of every people group, and even in the oral traditions of many people groups, such as many of the American Indian tribes. We see memories of what is in Genesis 1 through 11. Why is that? It's because Genesis 1 through 11 is a shared knowledge base of all people groups before they split up. And after the people group split up according to different languages, after that, what is in the Bible is not common to all the people groups. There are many linguistic and archeological discoveries that confirm the reliability of, of the biblical text. One of the spectacular examples is the discovery of the Dead Sea Scrolls. And that discovery in the mid 20th century Portions of copies of parts of every book of the Old Testament, save one, were discovered there, and those manuscripts were dated to the first or second century BC. That puts those manuscripts within two or three hundred years, four hundred years of when most of the Old Testament was written. One of the outcomes of that finding was to demonstrate a very high degree of accuracy of the copies of the full text of the Old Testament that we have today. One of the trends that we see in archaeology and in other scientific disciplines is repeated instances of corroborating what is in the book of Genesis. The book of Genesis is just reinforced again and again when we look through the ancient languages of the Chinese, when we look through the ancient flood accounts of different oral and written traditions around the world, when we look at the rock layers, you name it, the book of Genesis is being backed up by all the scientific disciplines. When you visit a coffee shop like this, you're likely to see people of diverse ethnicity from all walks of life. Remember, the Bible says we are all one race, human beings. There may be some physical differences between us in the color of our skin or the color of our eyes, but these are only superficial. The emphasis on differences and not our similarities comes from man, not the Bible. Race is an evolutionary concept that leads dangerously to the idea that some races are more advanced than others. Thomas Huxley used his book Evidence as to Man's Place in Nature to promote his racist views. Others have promoted the idea of race to justify one group of people's supposed superiority over another, or horribly, to justify man's inhumanity to man based on a perverse notion of survival of the fittest. But according to the Bible, 
We are all of one blood, descendants of Adam and Eve and the sons of Noah. And what does all this mean to us? Well, in Acts 17, 26, we read that he has made from one blood every nation of men to dwell on all the face of the earth and has determined their pre-appointed times and the boundaries of their dwellings. Who we are and how we got here are all by God's design. When we consider the current world population, it's easy to wonder if so many people could have actually descended from Noah. Even secular geneticists have to admit that we have a common ancestor. Christians call them Adam and Eve. As for the Tower of Babel, it's not just referenced in the Bible. The ancient Greek historian Herodotus wrote about it in 440 BC. Modern archeologists have excavated the ruins of Babylon and other places mentioned in the Bible. Understanding the scientific evidence that supports the biblical account builds confidence in our faith. God saved Noah because he has a plan for mankind. God scattered people across the earth because he has a plan for mankind. Sounds like God has a plan for all of us, me and you. I hope you'll join us next time when we turn our eyes to the skies and explore the universe. How long has everything been here? How did it begin? Keep watching as we continue unlocking the mysteries of Genesis. I know we're up against time, guys. Any quick comments or thoughts? I just wish I could have all of this information memorized so I can easily discuss it with somebody. The problem is, is I hear a little bit and I think I all of a sudden have become the expert, but then I don't, you know, um, really go and research it like I need to. I've written, several, yeah. written several notes about I need to go read this or I need to go look this up and I know what's going to happen is I'm going to get busy. Yeah. I won't go look up information on that volcano that exploded in 91 right. and I pay any attention to it and stuff and I and I and I again I, I kind of get it and I know that you know those best intentions kind of thing are understood by all but um I don't know like gone all the time he was like uh you should have learned that in high school Kathy and I was like was I just not paying attention <coughs> Or did I really get exposed to it and, you know, or did I have really bad teachers and they didn't expose me to it, but. Well, I love this series and I'm going to explore it more and more. Uh, fortunately, I'm retired and I can do some of that. So, uh, to me, it's an exciting adventure. Me too. I'm really yeah. enjoying it. Well, um, thanks so much, y'all. Uh, Don's, we're going to go ahead and, did you turn off the recording? We're going to go ahead and go into prayer requests. Um,